so I've heard that there's a special uh, visitor in uh, the UK at the moment, and um, he was quoted uh, this past year at the White House uh, Science Festival, or the Science Fair, as saying, I never miss a chance to see cool robots. So I'm having trouble <laughs> seeing in the upper balconies, but Obama, I don't know if you've made it, but um, <laughs> anyway, this is just for you. So I got a bit nervous after all these like professional presentation people making their presentations, so I decided to just have my robot do the presentation instead. Hello. How is everyone doing out there? Greetings Thinking Digital Conference. Thanks for inviting me, Herb. This here is my programmer, Heather Knight. <laughs> Give it up for Heather, the roboticist! Exclamation mark. My name is Data, and I will be your host for this presentation. I would like to say it is a pleasure to be here, but I am a robot and know no emotion. Heather, how about you get working on that emotion program? Oh, I thought you were supposed to do things for Really me. excited to be here in Newcastle tonight, because I don't need to eat your food. <laughs> my programmer designs my presentations with the goal of driving innovation in social robotics, which is the integration of robot helpers into everyday life. So you might as well get used to this. Right, guys? Just remember, <laughs> we will not ever steal your beer or your liquor. <laughs> it's almost cocktail hour, people. Is that not a comfort? One day we will be your companions. Social intelligence is so complex that many humans are not good at it. Any scientists or engineers in the house? I rest my case. <laughs> Do not feel bad. My interaction capabilities are worse than yours. Using your feedback, however, my programmer hopes that one day I will be an autonomous robotic performer. Like Kevin Costner. <laughs> or... Perhaps Charlie Sheen is a better choice. That's what is called a tag line in comedy. One day, I might be able to choose my own tags just by searching the internet. According to my feedback data, you are a wonderful crowd, and I am really glad you are here for me. Because I think I might be about to break up with my programmer. What? I caught her collecting videos of other robots. I don't feel pain. But that does not compute. I confronted her and she claims she needs to do research with other embodied machines to improve my response capabilities. But, again, that does not compute. She's calling it the robot film festival. She says it will be like the Bot Oscars. It will be in New York City on July 16. There will be a red carpet. They will be screening lots of robot short films. I'm feeling more than a little bit jealous. Oh man, I mean, I, I just like robots. I didn't mean for you to get jealous. It's okay. Don't touch me. <laughs> you hurt my feelings. There is only one thing I know that could win you back. I will impress you with my dance moves.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Heather, you just think about that for a second. I'm done. Oh. <laughs> right. Sorry, Data. Anyway. So, um, I'm in trouble. I'm throwing a robot film festival. I have stickers afterwards, about 100, so come up and ask. But um, in general, my presentation is also about devilishly charming robots. Um, so a little bit about my past. Uh, I was a MIT student uh, through my master's degree. I also worked for this French company that manufactures these robots, El Debron. Um, was at the Media Lab for a long time. That's where I got really inspired um, at this idea of machines that could have social capabilities and really impact us in our everyday lives, robots that could escape the factory and actually impact real people and catalyze connections and um, different work with therapy and hospitals, everyday education. Um, briefly worked in the space industry um, out in California and uh, and my afternoons or evenings and weekends got involved with this interactive art collective, Sin Labs, that we made uh, int like installation artwork that would be uh, on walls at uh, parties or concerts or festivals, and people could play and interact with them. And um, it would it would be kind of like a technological inebriation, so you could catalyze connections between people using technology. So that that and the social robotics work at the Media Lab have, have really influenced me. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, ambient art and robotics and narrative art and robotics. So a lot of the social robotics work I did in the past, I think, are, um, have been a lot about these kind of like just one-on-one -on -one personal interactions with something over a short period of time. And uh, I think that uh, visual art can teach you a lot about that. And then also this, what I'm looking into more recently, which has lots of overlaps with some of this Joseph Campbell hero's journey things. Um, for machines, which is how do you take a, like, take a long, make a long-lasting uh, like relationship with a robot? <laughs> um, I don't think the sex thing is really going to work out anytime soon. Um, <laughs> it doesn't compare uh, here. <laughs> but um, anyway, <laughs> and I, I heard they weren't selling well at all. I mean, I think it's like it's like anything that has social nuance is the, what's most difficult for. Um, robots, uh, but um, like they kind of start out as these like Nobel Prize winning physicists, so, like really good at all these really complex equations and abstract concepts, and it's really difficult for them to like be sitting on a couch enjoying a television program, but it's like absolutely impossible for them to be a three-year-old child and just play with objects and have imagination and learn, but that's something that I'd like uh, to work on. So, quote Albert Einstein, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and all science. So the unknown, the mysterious, is where art and science meet. So, learning from social interaction. So this is my second robotics project ever. Um, probably does not look like your typical um, stereotype of a MIT robotics lab. Um, it's a robotic flower garden. Cynthia Brazil, who just began the field of social robots, uh, was invited to include a, a piece from their lab um, in the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Design Museum. They do these uh, design triennials, and this was one back in 2003 um, was seen as this idea of social robots or, or charismatic technology in general, which I think is relevant to um, most of us here, uh, is like technology that can engage us in the kind of tap into our social uh, capacity and kind of programming um, and its power to actually make, to inspire and uh, uh, create new spaces for application and innovation. It's not as good without the music, but anyway. Right, so um, I was a sophomore um, in school. Uh, when I did this project. Hello. It's always the engineers that have the worst trouble with slides. Seems to have frozen.
I think I've pressed every button I can press. Okay. Right. Um, so, <laughs> magic, um, you know, it's, it's capacitive. Uh, right, so I studied electrical engineering, that reminds me. Um, so uh, I, I liked, <laughs> I started as a mechanical engineer, so I really like bus building physical things. And uh, one thing I would like to propose to this community is that we um, replace uh, computers with robots, not people with robots. Um, and what I mean by that is um, both in bringing in these ideas of, yes, breaking down the fourth screen or the wall, um, but also kind of getting into our physical spaces, because um, that's how we, that's like uh, evolutionarily, that's, that's what we exist in. This is what makes us happy. Like, you know, when we're actually in these environments with other human beings. And so if you can use create technology that can still have all of these capacities of like the internet and the cloud and access to information, but actually bring that into our everyday environments and have them communicate and operate with us in a social way, then we wouldn't, maybe we wouldn't have to have these kind of barriers against ourself, uh, which I sometimes think is the screen. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so this is a project that I did in the collaboration with the uh, MIT Mobility Lab in Pitié Imagine in um, Florence, and uh, it's a uh, piece that, uh, uh, when you walked into uh, this exhibit, which was actually a warehouse where they would show off a fashion trade show, um, and this was to engage people as they came in. So there are lots of different types of sensors, uh, like including cameras and capacitive sensing, which I'll talk about more in just a second. Um, and so you can start using uh, this 3D physical object as your interaction space and, and playing with that. And so obviously you can see we're doing this in a more um, physical environment. Uh, there's something like 8,000 individually um, like wired uh, fiber optic cables on the piece. And it was a great project for me. Um, I'd been working on pattern rec recognition for uh, touch uh, for a robotic teddy bear, which I'll show you in the next slide. And so they brought me on the project because they thought uh, I could help design applications that would be interesting and engaging for people that walked into that space. But you imagine, um, I was talking to some people yesterday, like the, state, the original state of uh, web design, where design was almost non-existent. And then you can, as it develops, like the, the aesthetics of that piece, I love this part because when you touch it, it makes a big splash. Um, but as web development continues, design becomes, has become such an integral part of that. And I think that as we get more and more embodied machines in our physical environment, having a, a knowledge of their social capacities and how to best um, tap into that in us is really important. Like there's a really hot topic in robotics right now. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, also a doctoral student at Carnegie Mellon University at the moment, um, doing my thesis on robot theater, um, which sounds crazy, but um, I'll tell you about that a little bit later. Um, but uh, yeah, and I, th I think there's, there's just a huge amount that we can learn uh, from, from artistic designers and, and from thinking about interfaces and how to uh, actually engage and inspire people. So just briefly, a uh, more technical uh, project. This is my master's thesis. Um, at the Media Lab, uh, it was a robotic teddy bear, and so I did lots of user studies with different groups of adults and children to try to understand when you walk into a room and you see something that looks more or less like a person, we, we immediately kind of personalize it and think it, well, if it talks to us, maybe we're going to try talking back and see if it understands that. And if it looks like a teddy bear, because all these sensors fit under a teddy bear fur, they're a capacitive, kind of like what you would have on your iPhone or Android, um, as I have. But, um, and so try to do, uh, to break down how do we communicate through touch. So there's kind of like symbolic things um, or just communicate non-verbally in general. Like if you shake someone's hand, uh, that has a particular meaning. Like if, if, the, if the robot kind of falls asleep, supposedly, like there's certain ways that we'd automatically try to wake it up. And so it's you're designing interfaces around what we naturally do socially. Uh, and in that process, the, these technology becomes a foil for ourselves. So we end up learning a lot about human behavior and in the same way machine vision like we thought at one point, like in 1955, they gave like three grad students a summer to figure out all of machine vision and uh, like a list of maybe like eight items. They're like, it's not, it's, I mean, we see, everyone sees things every day. It can't be that hard for a computer to figure out how to find like a path through the forest. But um, anyway, most of those things in that list we're still working on in some form or another uh, 55, 60 years later. So 
It's, uh, it, I think there's a lot in designing technology that you don't appreciate and what seems normal and easy for us. But it certainly opens up a lot of new kinds of applications and possibility. So um, I, I've learned a lot from kind of watching people engage with different uh, like physical art pieces I have. And, then, and I, I'm not naturally a performer. I like, like visual stuff. Um, but I've suddenly been trying to learn a lot from performers themselves. And, and uh, I think that they, th there's, there's a lot of uh, methodologies um, that have been thought through and tested on generations and generations of human performers. They're kind of our artificial character and personality experts uh, that I am looking to cross-apply and uh, use in the design of robotic systems. So um, there was, I, I co-wrote uh, the uh, initial presentation of the robot um, with a comedian, for example, and I think comedy is one of those really fundamentally human things, and humor is also going to be really difficult for robots, but a little bit can go a long way, even if they can, if technology itself, I mean, we've done a great job using technology that enables people to be social, but if technology can even become slightly more social, there have been studies done with, uh, like, the navigation systems in cars, like, that. if it's, like, in this really cheery voice when you've just taken a wrong turn, you get really angry and you're more likely to make further mistakes. Um, so if you have this affect mismatch, where affect is emotion, um, then uh, technology doesn't work as well. So his path left planning may be suboptimal, but it's got flair. This is a right. So I started these um, some experiments with this robot in the entertainment uh, world uh, this past summer in New York City. I let him loose in uh, uh, Washington Square Park in New York City, um, and the kids could show him these postcards. He'd recognize. Um, like an icon in the middle of the postcard and then give a whole little sketch about that neighborhood. Very simple technologically, but I was really interested in watching how people would engage. I was really nervous an hour before, no one's going to want to hang out with my robot. And then, of course, it was like crowds and wild and crazy. And that was, that was great. Um, and then uh, later in the year, in December, I developed an uh, uh, algorithm for the robot to be able to track the audience response, like laughter and applause, which was amazing to see two presentations ago, like, annotated. So to think about how, uh, so he had a database of jokes in his head that were labeled along some attribute scales, like how much he was moving, um, the likelihood that people had heard it before, uh, like uh, the length, uh, the appropriateness level, and I, I forget, there were maybe a couple others. But um, so he would kind of test the audience and see what direction made sense for that particular audience and then kind of go and try to find uh, what you would particularly like. It's sort of like Netflix over the long term, but I'm, but I'm interested in more complexity as well, but it was kind of a first demo of how you could uh, create a charismatic performer that's actually interacting live um, with an audience. Uh, I think that failure is really important, and, 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 so, and I think robots need to be able to embrace a failure and not be so sensitive all the time and get their feelings hurt. But um, <laughs> and, and so, like, it's it's positive and negative examples can be really important um, for a machine learning algorithm. And as long as you constrain the learning space for even for a robot performer, you can use an intelligent stage that has lots of sensors. Um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of lots of fun possibilities. So this is uh, just a diagram of how that particular. Uh, uh, algorithm worked. There was it's very simple, just like a basic model of what they would the, he thought you would enjoy, and then he would select a joke and tell that joke. Uh, this wasn't live today because I wanted to make it more personal, but um, yeah, and uh, so track input. But I'm really interested in take, creating that arc over time. And another, I think, really formative project, I, t I told you, like, the, the like, two major influences are this idea of social robots and all the people who have, like, uh, inspired me there, a lot at the Media Lab, um, some just working with this robot in Paris. Um, but also, um, when I was in LA and working for, like, and making installations with this, this group, Sin Labs, like, we made a music video um, with OK Go, and it was a big Rube Goldberg machine, so one thing hits another thing hits another thing, and I'll just show you that in a second. Um, but I think performers really are our human charisma specialists, and if there's a way that we can uh, collaborate, I'm really into interdisciplinary collaboration between artists, um, and, and well, so for social robots, it was always psychologists, but these days, like, for, for performers and, and robotics. Uh, so I started a robot theater company called Marilyn Monrobot, also based in New York City, um, so we do occasional performances with that. We're throwing the Robot Film Festival, and I'm just going to show you this video because I think that you can sympathize with a machine.
real. technology uh, something that we care about and uh, I think that collaborations with the arts are really important and wonderful and stay in touch. Thank you. Oh, okay, great. So uh, that, that last video, was that all just a single shot? It was uh, just a single camera person? It did make it all the way through two times out of maybe, uh, if you start counting at the tire, like 82 different trials over a two and a half day period, it right. completed twice. Right. Um, and there is one cut in that particular shot at the curtain. Right. Um, just to make, choose the most beautiful shots. There yeah. was a hand operated elevator when it went from the top level to the bottom level. And yeah. Um, yeah, so it was just slightly out of sync. How long did it take to say, I can't believe just how long uh, it we goes were, like, on. We were working on the project for maybe uh, six months, like really three months in this space. Nice. Um, you know, and uh, a third of the machines changed in the last week when the band came back from tour. God. Which was, in, was really was in, painful. That but, was in LA. Yeah, this, yeah, is, LA this is in LA, so yeah. yeah. Um, and with with regard to the robot, yeah, yeah. I mean, is it is it in, in your field? Is it like uh, a kind of like equivalent of like a robot Turing test, where there's the goal? Is there a goal like the, that the the transaction with, or the interaction with the robot becomes as as if you were speaking to a human? Is that uh, sort right. Of like so it's kind of interesting. There's some really big differences between kind of computer science as a field and robotics as a field, mm -hmm. because like computer science is kind of philosophical. It's very abstract. You can kind of make anything in code, um, mm. and so, it's, so you can kind of like really think about like grand theories. Mm. Robotics is uh, always based on a, one physical platform or a mm. like sequence of physical platforms. So mm. it tends to be a lot more application specific. But the interesting thing that happens is people will um, make something crazy like a robot teddy bear that's originally intended to be in a hospital to mm. help like a uh, bridge the gap between like a scary doctor and a young child mm. and like make them kind of feel at home or like even uh, if they were you know subject to seizures so they could like mm. alert a nurse or something like that so that's like the application we were thinking of and mm. then as soon as you make this 
pet robotic teddy bear, everyone's like, oh, and this is, you know, whatever, seven years ago? Mm -hmm. Or they're like, oh, well, we should make this telepresence platform for grandma, because the two-year-old's not going to want to, like, uh, well, I guess, not, not going to want to talk on the phone. Well, now mm -hmm. we have Skype, but it's even better is a teddy bear. So, mm -hmm. so grandma can just either talk through the teddy bear or, like, <laughs> puppeteer it, and, you know, and then the kid will actually, that's a, that's a social interaction, so you right. don't have to worry about um, the technology or right. the screen. So. We had a fellow in Caleb Chung uh, here a couple yeah. years ago with, Leo, which right. I'm sure you're familiar with. Kind of Robot thing. dinosaur. That they they chose funny. to make it a baby dinosaur because uh, we couldn't have any real creature to compare it against. To <laughs> so, <laughs> so that I would have more like, leeway in having things go slightly wrong. I but, did um, think it was very effective, though, in transmitting a sense of emotion or evoking emotion from, from people kind of thing as right. well. You know, so um, and I'm just wondering if that's, I mean, ultimately, actually, practical question, how much does that cost? I mean, can you buy one? Yeah, um, uh, yes, uh, probably, what is it, like 12,000 euros, something okay. like that? Right, so. Um, if, yeah. Maybe more. I might be able to get you a discount if you ask real nice. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's generally used by researchers. I mean, some of the other systems I was working with at, at, before at the Media Lab would, would, be, come, would be cheap if there were 200,000. So right. in terms of a whole research lab, the barrier to entry mm. of a lower cost platform like that. Mm. <laughs> I know it's, mm. not, it's not a consumer product yet. But, um, and does it take a fair amount of setting up in terms of basically programming in to, 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 to get that to um, it's a, it depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, yeah. like uh, we create an application called Choreograph, um, mm -hmm. which I think is aptly named. Uh, that kind of has a flash programming look like timeline, so you can keyframe it and it will like uh, infer the motion uh, timelines. And then, but so it, it just depends on the complexity of the interaction. Okay. Um, there, there it is much easier to work with than most robots that I've played with, which, which is why I can carry it on the plane and mm. bring it to conferences. Mm. Um, is there a sense as to when they might become these household things that we've been doing? Right, so I, I feel like it's the, not the technology right now it's, mm. uh, that's the barrier. It's kind of like, like how we use what we currently have, and that's mm. when, one of the reasons why I'm looking towards collaborations with people outside of the field of engineering, because I feel like within engineering we kind of like are, we're like, we have to solve this problem, and so we get really focused on like the barriers to like, you know, perfect computer vision or perfect like uh, voice and speech, uh, speech recognition, mm. and, um, but if you think about what people actually want, uh, you can already start designing things that, that would be applicable. Like, like I mentioned earlier, that this idea of autism therapy um, is, is really, uh, has been showing some really interesting results, like that, that kids feel more comfortable um, talking through a robot than talking to the therapist, or it can be used as a reward, and obviously the robot can't replace that, but this idea of a triad where you can have a, the doctor, a robot, and another person, or the nurse, the robot, and the child, um, like robots can certainly enable interactions, mm -hmm. like, and like they did all these studies in Japan using a robotic seal showing that in the nursing home people would talk more with each other when they had this point, when they <laughs> had this like sort of social-ish, mm -hmm. not like a super successful social character, but like <laughs> one that was more like a pet and it would start evoking them uh, of sure. sociability within them. So mm -hmm. I feel like robots as enablers to people, uh, that's already something that, that can happen. Thank you, and thank you for being data as well. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>